As we look at part one, we see Judas, the disciples, and even Peter betraying, abandoning, and rejecting Jesus. And we ask ourselves our question, what did Jesus know? And if he knew, how would that impact and affect him walking forward? Number one, we see the betrayal of Judas. We read earlier, and let me read it again, Matthew 26, verses 20 through 25. It says, when it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. Those are his twelve disciples. And as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to to say one after the other, Is it I, Lord? And he answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said to him, You have said so. Jesus, eating with his 12 closest friends, closest followers, the the disciples who lived, breathed, ate with him for the last three years. He's eating his final meal before the most brutal suffering that a human could encounter. And he's betrayed by someone close to him. And Jesus knew it. He calls him out. You have said so. Not only does he does he call him out, not only does he know, he lets it happen. He doesn't stop him. Jesus is betrayed by a close friend. And then we see Judas exit. We see the disciples together, and then they leave. They go to a garden where Jesus is going to spend time in prayer. And at the end of this, if you if you see uh, verse what is it fifty six of chapter twenty verse fifty six of chapter twenty six, it says at the end of this, Judas has now betrayed him, and the mob has come to seize Jesus. And it says the very last sentence of the passage says, "Then all you can look up all it means all." Then all the disciples left him and fled. How heartbreaking would it be to not only be betrayed by one of your 12 closest friends, but then to be abandoned by them all. Now you can go back just a few verses. Go back to chapter 26, verse 30, and let's read. It says this, And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus knew that he would, that they would leave him. In fact, just a few verses later, they're praying and Jesus is praying so intensely uh, that passages say blood is coming out of his brow at the intensity of his prayers. And he goes back and what does he find his disciples doing? Sleeping. They can't even stay awake and pray with him in his greatest moment of need. Not only can they not pray with him, they're going to very soon abandon him. Finally, the the one that probably hurt the most, at least from my assumption, is the rejection and denial of Peter. Just go back to that passage we were just reading, chapter 26, verse 33 continues, uh, when Jesus tells them they're all going to fall away. Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. The very ones we just read, all left him and fled, all said, oh yeah, we're with Peter. We're here till the end. And even Peter, at verse 75, it says in Peter, when he had denied him, Three times. Remember the saying of Jesus before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And what happened to Peter? And he went out and wept 
bitterly. Jesus was betrayed, he was abandoned, and he was rejected. And in all three situations, he knew exactly what was coming. You know what? Just because you know it's coming, I don't think, cons- I don't think softens the blow. Have you ever experienced that where you, you knew that someone was going to fail you? You knew that someone was going to betray you, going to turn against you. You just, it, whatever the setting is, you just have this, this, you just know. But that doesn't prepare you for when it actually happens. You can know something, but when it physically, emotionally actually occurs, you see this even with loved ones. When we have loved ones who, 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 who are older in life and who go through health issues, maybe it's cancer or the like, and we know that the end is coming. And you can prepare yourself as well as possible, but when the day comes, nothing can prepare you fully. There's pain there. There's heartache there. Jesus is betrayed, abandoned, rejected, and he knows. And yet, he stays the course. Friends, think about this right now. In our current reality, we are in this quarantine, this stay-at-home order. You are experiencing solitude. Perhaps even some of you are alone in your residence. Not able to be with your family. Not able to be with your friends. Some of you even have, have, have stooped so low in your depravity that you even miss some of your coworkers. And sure, there's technology, there's FaceTime and the Marco Polo and the Zooms, but it's just not the same, is it? All of a sudden, we're, we're figuring out when we don't have the face-to-face, life-on-life interaction that, this is, that digital just isn't the same. It does not suffice. While we may be alone and while, while we may be quarantined. Jesus wasn't simply alone. Again, he was betrayed, abandoned, and rejected by his closest friends. Perhaps you've experienced betrayal, abandonment, rejection. How did that impact you? Was there depression? Was there despair? Was there paralyzation? It just, it just stopped you and, and, and halted your life? There was pain there. It hurt. Friends, Jesus experienced all three of them in in a matter of hours, and yet he does not break. What is the clue? What is the secret to not breaking when the people closest to you fail you at the ultimate level? Well, there's a clue in his prayer. When he prays in the garden, what does he say? He says, my father, If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Who's he he directing his prayer to? Peter? Judas? No. My father. In fact, when he goes back to the disciples and he, he says, could you not watch with me one hour? He says, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, God the Son has lived eternally with the Father and the Spirit. That yes, we have human friendships and human relationships, close relationships, marriages and, 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 and children and, and, and family, and yet there are relationships that are deeper and stronger. That is the relationship with you and God. In fact, Jesus tells us, after his resurrection in Matthew 28, 20, he says to his disciples, and he speaks to us today, he says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Friends, in the face of betrayal, in the face of abandonment, in the face of rejection, Jesus continues to walk forward. Jesus knew that all three elements were going to happen, and yet he still walked forward in the plans and the purposes and the will of God. Let us now hear the readings of the 27th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew as we continue the story of the passion of Jesus Christ. 
When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief of priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why, what evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments amongst them, casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. And, when, and two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who crucified him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, leme sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there. 
sitting opposite the tomb. Now we turn to the final section, the suffering and death of Jesus. Jesus is falsely accused. He's mocked, beaten, questioned, whipped within an inch of his life, beaten again, mocked again, tortured with a crown of thorns thrust into his head, publicly vilified and condemned, made to carry his means of execution on the road to his death, nailed to a cross, naked and then lifted up for all to see. He's parched, dehydrated, barely able to breathe, bleeding out, suffocating, and dead. Jesus, did you know? Who would willingly endure all of that? Remember the book I talked about? The book with your past and your future? Would would you read that book knowing that you couldn't change the future in it? Friends, if that was in your book and you read it, there is no, even if you knew you couldn't change it, you would fight tooth and nail against that future. Three scriptures, Matthew chapter 20, verse 17, it says, And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. They will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. Jesus knew. Not just that he would die. He knew some pretty intense details. He'd be mocked and flogged and crucified. In fact, if you have an ESV, English Standard Version Bible, the the title on top of this paragraph is Jesus foretells his death a third time. This ain't even the first time he's told this to his disciples. If you go back or or forward to Matthew chapter 26, the very first verse, Jesus has been teaching and he says, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. Jesus is telling them what awaits you. At the center of the passion, in the final meal that Jesus and his disciples are taking, after Judas has has called himself out on his betrayal and has left the room, it says in verse 26, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and say, take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he he gave it to them, saying, Drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The cross, the beatings, the whippings, they're not an emotional reality. They are a physical reality. His blood is not just some symbolic thing he's gesturing to. The blood in his human body is about to be poured out in physical fashion. Three questions. Number one, what did Jesus experience? Well, we've just been reading it. In 24 hours, he experienced the brutality, the pain, the betrayal, and the suffering of a lifetime. Question number two, what did Jesus know? And as scripture is revealed, he knew everything. He knew the betrayal. He knew the abandonment. He knew the the false imprisonment and the mocking and the beating and the crucifixion that awaited him, even to the moment of the blood being poured out 
And see, that's the key here. How does he know everything and still walk the path? Why? The third question answers that. The third question is, what did the passion of Jesus accomplish? And the answer is this, your salvation. The brutality and the betrayal and the abandonment and the beatings and the the mocking and the crushing and the crucifixion and the blood poured out is the accomplishment of your salvation. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Yes, because the angel told her. But Mary wasn't the only one that knew. Jesus knew. And that's why he walked the path. Even though he knew what it would cost him. Jesus put you above his own comfort, above his own self-preservation. He suffered so you could be free. Some of you might be familiar with the movie Braveheart. It's the Mel Gibson movie, the story of William Wallace. He was one of the main leaders in the first war of Scottish independence uh, against England in the late 13th, early 14th century. In the late 13th century, he was finally captured and brought before King Edward of England, who was so enraged at William Wallace that he had him him hung. But before he could die uh, in this hanging, he had him released. And then he had him disemboweled. And I could go into further grotesquement about that disembowelment, but I'll save you that horror story. You can go read about it. After that, he beheaded him, quartered him, and hung him up as an example to the Scots. Now, in the movie, he has one famous last word. It actually wasn't his last words. He actually has some pretty good last words. You can go look those up, too. But in the movie, he says one famous last word as he's being disemboweled. And what is it? Freedom! He shouts. The question is, did his death accomplish that freedom? William Wallace fought and died for freedom. But you know what? Scotland didn't gain its independence from England for 23 years after the death of William Wallace. Now, sure, his death was a, was a rallying cry. It, it gave momentum. But 23 years is a long time from the word freedom to actual freedom. At the crucifixion of Jesus, moments before he died, he cries out three final words words. Not one, freedom, but three. It is finished. Jesus will save his people from their sins, is what the angel said. And at the moment of his death, stamped, completed. Forgiveness is given by and through the blood of Jesus. It it is the forgiveness and freedom from sin that is brought about by his blood. What did Jesus experience? Betrayal, abandonment, rejection, mocking, beating, brutality, and death. What did Jesus know? Everything. And yet he walked the path. Why? Because he knew what it was. It would accomplish. It would accomplish your freedom. Good Friday reveals the passion of Jesus. The love of the Son to the Father and toward his creation. There is no greater love, there is no greater passion than the love of Jesus revealed in his life and in his death. And so tonight, 
if you are watching, if you are experiencing this and you have not professed Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, if you have not reached and grasped and held on to the freedom that he has secured for you, the, the freedom that he gifts to you simply by the profession of your faith in him, which in itself is a gift of God given to you to even be able to profess him as Lord and Savior. If you have not done that tonight, would you right now believe in your heart that, that God has given you the gift of grace, covered your sin by the blood of Jesus, given you complete forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation to him in relationship? Would you profess that Jesus is Lord and Savior, confess and repent of your sin, live for Jesus? Philippians 1.21, the apostle writes to the church in Philippi, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Live for Jesus. And for those of us who, who have professed, who believe, then I want us tonight to celebrate, to take communion, to remember the blood of Christ shed for us, the body of Christ crucified to atone for the wrath of our sin. We go back to Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. Jesus, as they were eating, took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat this. This is my body. Friends, you'll take a piece of bread and you'll remember that God the Son, second member of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, who has no form, has no barriers, has no limits, confined himself into a human body through a natural birth to live for you, to not only live to die, to live a righteous life, a life of worship to God, how God intended, why, how God created us to live in vibrant worship as Adam and Eve at one moment did in the Garden of Eden until they fell to temptation and rebelled against God. Jesus lived a life not of rebellion, but of worship, which allowed his human body to take on the wrath of God that was us. We should have been on that cross. You should have been on that cross. You should have absorbed the weight and the punishment of your sin because all of your rebellion all of your apathy against God, all of your selfishness, all of that sin is worthy of righteous judgment. And instead, Jesus, his body broken, bled out for us. Take and remember his body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. As you take the cup of juice or wine, remember that it wasn't just a, a body lived for you. He is not just a good example. He is not just a moral teacher. He lived and died for you, shed his blood so that you may be cleansed, you may be forgiven. The final sacrifice once and for all has been made. There are no more sacrifices for sin. Jesus is it. Drink the cup 
and remember his death, suffered for you in your place. Finally, verse 29, Jesus goes on. He says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Friends, as we, as we reflect on the life and the death of Jesus, we remember our trajectory. Our trajectory isn't in our one day impending death on this earth. Friends, Good Friday is about the greatest death that's ever occurred. But Easter Sunday is about resurrection. Jesus knew that resurrection was coming. We know that the resurrection has occurred. And so as we take this meal, that's why we don't give in to the, the utter darkness of Good Friday, the weight and the overwhelming depth of it, because we know Resurrection Sunday is coming. And we know that we can say with Paul, to live as Christ, to die as gain. Why? Because resurrection is coming. As we look at Good Friday, we remember that freedom has been secured. You live not for the kingdom of this world, temporary and fleeting. You live for the kingdom of God, coming in power, coming in fullness. Your freedom has been secured. It is finished. Will you receive this freedom? And will you walk in this freedom for such a time as this? Will you give in to fear and anxiety? Will you, give, will you give in to what you do not know? We don't know if our health is at stake. We don't know if our economic reality is at stake right this moment. What we do know is to live as Christ and to die as gain. Because I do not live for a kingdom of this world. I live for the kingdom of God. Where one day Jesus and I will drink and eat together face to face. Father God, I pray that you would help us reflect well on Good Friday, that we would reflect on the life and death, the sacrifice, the passion and love of Jesus as he pours out his life for us, that we would, that we would reflect and that we would worship, remembering remembering such a great sacrifice, remembering the love of God. There is no greater picture of love than the passion of Jesus Christ. May our remembrance, may our meditation, may our reflection lead us to worship and lead us to the hope of Resurrection Sunday. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.